Good morning, Ramus South Coast Family Church, and welcome to our online service. We are so glad you've joined us today. And before we dig into the word and just give you some of the house news, let's take a moment just to focus on to the goodness of God. Maybe just uh, dwell on the scripture for a moment, and we're going to enter into a time of praise and worship as we honor the Lord Jesus Christ. How are you guys all doing? Can I tell you something? I'm thirsty this morning. Look to the person next to you and I tell them, are you thirsty? Are you thirsty for some living water? Amen. Join us.
It sure is good to be in a place where we can worship the Lord, and it's our privilege to be at your service today. So before we dig into the word, here are just a few things that are happening in the church at the moment or coming up. Don't forget, you can go to social media and you can send us a WhatsApp if you want to find out any more details. Firstly, we have our ladies' event that is coming up on the 26th of February. It's 50 rand per lady and it will start here at the church at 10 a.m. So please make sure you pay your money, book your name down, and maybe think of inviting a friend or sponsoring a lady who perhaps can't afford it. Then, remember at the end of last year, we were going to have a church social to celebrate the end of the year, and we got literally rained out. Well, we've reset the date, and uh, that is coming up on the public holiday, the 21st of March. So please remember, if you're already booked and paid your 10 rand, if you'll just uh, send us a little note, or on Sunday, tick your name off so that we know you're still coming. And then if you want to come and you're never booked, here's your opportunity. Either send us a WhatsApp or go to the info bar, book down your name, pay your 10 rand, and we would love to see you there. It really is going to be a fun day of fellowship and get together. You can bring your picnic basket, or you can choose to uh, bribe, bring your own meat. We'll make sure the fires are lit. Uh, Bring your salads and your cold drinks, and together we're going to have a great time. Now, don't forget, the way you connect with the life of the church is by joining either our small groups, or if you're a young person, join our youth ministry on a Friday night, and uh, our WhatsApp remain on the Uh, Sorry, our small groups remain on the WhatsApp format at the moment, but we will be having our very first small group celebration and harvest event on the Wednesday, the 9th of March. So put that down if you want to come and find out more about small groups, or if you just want to come have a midweek service where we're going to worship and dig into the Word. You are so welcome. Now, this past Sunday, we just started a fresh census in our church. During COVID, uh, we didn't know who was and who wasn't part of the church. We've had so many visitors and so many people inquiring about the church. So we want to invite you, if you are part of our church, if you see this as your local church, then please would you fill in a census form, and that is for everyone who is 18 and older. Now, you can complete it online if you go to rfcfc.com. On our first page, if you scroll down, you will be able to complete that form and email it to us. Or send us a WhatsApp and we will send you the link directly uh, to that questionnaire and that survey. So please be part of it, participate with us, help us to reestablish our database and to update all your information. God bless you. Let's dig into the Word this morning. And we're on a journey uh, at the beginning of this year. We've entitled our series, Much more. And today's subtitle is Let's Take the Journey. Now, if we can just for a moment turn back to Revelation chapter 3, verse 18, because we established some important spiritual dynamics around walking in the much more that God has for us. And here in verse 18, it says, God speaking after he had corrected uh, the church of Jesus Christ. He says to them in verse 18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich, white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve so that you may see. Now it's so important that as we, as we study this portion of scripture, it speaks to us and there's something here that I want to identify and clarify that we didn't do when we were talking about the scripture a couple of weeks back. And that is this. This verse literally embodies and speaks about the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, grace is so deep and so full that you could never do it justice with with just one description. You and I need to continually have a fresh revelation of Jesus Christ We need to continue to receive his word so that we can understand the depth and the enormity of his grace. But let me try just for a moment, if you'll turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 6 to 10, and let's have a look at how this book of the Bible describes the incredible, amazing grace. 
to the praise of the glory of His grace, by which He made us accepted in the Beloved. So the first thing we see is grace makes you accepted in the body of Christ. In Him, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. So we learn from this verse that God's grace is rich, and it's full, and it's powerful, which He has made abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence. The next cool thing we learn about grace is that it's abounding towards us. In other words, it's continually moving towards our lives. Having made known to us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He purposed in Himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in Him. So the final thing we learn about grace in this portion of Scripture is that it revolves around Christ. It's fulfilled in Christ, and Jesus always needs to be the center of God's amazing grace. So we can definitely say this about grace. It's God's favor and ability being given to us to live the Christian life So we become more like Jesus. Because how many of you know, we cannot do that in our own strength. Let me be clear. Grace is not a divine cop-out for you and I to live in the flesh, to ignore God's word, and do what we want to do. Completely the opposite. And so it's in this context of grace that God counsels the church after correcting them and saying that it's grace that brings you faith, righteousness, and the anointing. And that's where the power and the beauty of God rests. Now remember we clarified when he spoke about these three things. He said, come buy gold, come put on white garments, and come anoint your eyes with our soul, that it clarified and spoke to you and I about faith, righteousness, and the anointing, or we could say it like this, spiritual insight, having the eyes of our heart opened. Now what's really beautiful about this portion of scripture that we want to unpack this morning as well, it is the only place in the New Testament where the word I solve is found. What is quite amazing is that if you study a little bit of history and you read the commentaries of this portion of Scripture, you'll find that this Asolv was referring to a product that was made by people during that time. They would mix a whole lot of medicinal things together, make it into like a, an ointment or a solve that they would put on people's eyes that had eye ailments, and it would bring healing restoration, and clarity to their eyes. In other words, what Paul is saying here is that when we would put that eye solve on our eyes, spiritually our eyes would be opened to experience and see the empowered and wonderful picture of the grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That those who were blind could now begin to see clearly the character of God, the beauty of salvation, and the loveliness of the person and work of Jesus Christ. Now, when you see that, it changes you on the inside, and it empowers you on the outside. The idea was this, that Paul not only wanted their hearts to be right with God, but he wished that their understanding and their souls would be opened so that they could see God's purpose for themselves more clearly. He reveals this so specifically in Galatians chapter 2, verses 20 and 21. Let's have a look at it in the Passion Translation. My old identity has been co-crucified with Christ and no longer lives. Did you hear that? My old identity has been crucified with Christ and it no longer lives. And now the essence of of this new life is no longer mine, for the anointed one lives his life through me. We live in union as one. 
My new life is empowered by the faith of the Son of God who loves me so much that he gave himself for me, dispensing his life into mine. So that is why I don't view God's grace as something peripheral. For if keeping the law could release God's righteousness to us, then Christ would have died for nothing. Isn't that incredible? That this few verses of Scripture speak about the grace of God confirming that faith, righteousness, and the anointing are released into our lives when we receive and understand the grace of God. Now, last week, Pastor Mandy did such a great job showing us that both Abraham and Joshua were on this journey to possess the land that God had promised them. As a matter of fact, God said to them, there is so much more for you to still possess. She continued to say that as we're on this expedition of faith, we must never retire or resign our faith. So today, I want to continue along those lines with the story of Abraham and his servant Eliezer to find some practical things we can walk out as we discover the much more. Now, I want to clarify right at the beginning, this series is not about you and I pursuing more riches or obtaining things from God. Definitely not. As a matter of fact, I think Matthew 6.33 fully qualifies and establishes what we're referring to when we speak about the much more. It says in verse uh, 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. In other words, we don't have to pursue the more in the natural things when we pursue God in the spiritual things. Now, let's ask ourselves a couple of important questions here. Let's clarify and ask ourselves, what is seeking his kingdom and his righteousness? Because I've heard a lot of things of what people say it is. And I'm sure many of them are right and correct. But I want to ask that question. I want to answer it in, in my best possible way. The second question is, are the things that I currently have in my life, my possessions, my wealth, my relationships, the things I have, are they things that God has added to my life? Or are they the things I have because I pursued them and obtained them? That is such a, a defining question to ask because it kind of establishes the importance of where our hearts are. Now here are a few references from this portion of scripture that I think will help us to actually answer the first question. In 1 Kings 3 verse 13, which is a direct reference to this verse, it says God speaking to Solomon. Remember when he'd asked uh, Solomon for what he wanted, and Solomon responded by saying, give me wisdom to shepherd and to rule over your people in a godly way. And in verse 13, look how God answers. He says, I will not only make you the wisest man in the world, but in verse 13, he says this, and I've also given you what you did not ask for, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be anyone like you among the kings of all the kings all your days. In other words, the picture of Matthew 6.33 is described by the way Solomon lived. He sought after God's wisdom first, after the way God does things, and God was the one who was able to add the other stuff. And that's so important. Then again, a New Testament scripture reference is found in 1 Timothy 4, verses 8 and 9. And here it says, for bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for everything, having the promise of the life that now is and of that which is still to come. Look what he says in verse 9. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. In other words, he says, yes, you've got to look after your body. Yes, you've got to exercise. Yes, you've got to do the practical things in your life. But never forget that the real value in our lives comes out of who we're becoming, 
what we believe because that controls ultimately what we do. So with that in mind, have a look at the same verse in the Passion Translation, and I'm going to add verse 34 to it. It says, so above all, constantly seek God's kingdom and his righteousness, then all these less important things will be given to you abundantly. Refuse to worry about tomorrow. And this is what I want you to focus on. But deal with each challenge that comes your way one day at a time. Tomorrow will take care of itself. So Jesus here was elaborating and showing us how we can live a carefree life. We live a carefree life by putting God first, making him our priority, and then facing the challenges of every day for that day. Because when you do that, when you do your best to put God first in your life, when you wake up tomorrow morning, you wake up in the will of God, and God can funnel and channel his wisdom through your life. So what does it mean to seek his kingdom and his righteousness? Well, here's another thought. Yes, people have said, well, that's your prayer time. That's, you know, spending more time in worship. That's taking time out of, out of the year every now and then as you're led by the Spirit to fast and pray. Some people have said that's going to Bible school. Uh, pastors have said that's going to church every Sunday. And I agree with all of that. We need to be doing those things. That is making God our priority. But I want to add to that today. Seeking his kingdom and his righteousness means that I plan my life in a way that I am busy with the things that I know God has called me to do. I'm doing my best to live out my purpose according to the talents, treasures, and time that God has given me. In other words, seeking God's kingdom first is doing what you're supposed to be doing right now with your life. And so if it's Monday morning and you need to be at work, guess what? Being at work on time, working hard and giving your best is seeking God's kingdom and his righteousness. And so when we start to think about that, it means everything in our lives is important and everything in our lives we can enjoy and there's nothing in our lives that we need to worry about when we're doing that. So today, I wanna take you on a journey as we continue with the life of Abraham, but we're gonna look specifically at his servant, Eliezer. And we're gonna just pull out this week and next week a whole lot of things, practical things that we can apply to our lives so that we keep moving forward in this much more in our lives in 2022. So the first one is this. If you want to write this down, number one, you've got to focus your life. You've got to focus your life. And here in Genesis 24, verse 1, it says, Now Abraham was old, well advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Wow. Here's another example of someone who sought God's kingdom and his righteousness first. And it says here that as Abraham got older, God had blessed him in everything. Isn't that amazing? Now, this is what I want to say to us today. You know, the next five years can be the greatest five years of our lives if we would just decide to be focused. They can become a time where your life is more focused on Jesus, and as a result, you're able to make an impact in everything you do. Let's look at how we do that. Firstly, you must begin to develop an image, that's why our eyes need to be open, of who God wants you to be, your identity, and where you believe God wants you to go or to be busy with. You've got to develop that image because you, can, you and I cannot be focused if we don't see what it is we need to be focused on. Number two, to get focused on this, we need to take a first step and ask ourselves one or two questions. Number one, what is my current position? In other words, where am I now? Where am I, where am I now spiritually? Where am I financially? Where am I emotionally? Where am I in my relationships? Where am I physically? And where am I occupationally? You see, if you don't ask 
where you are now, then you can't establish with focus where you want to go. And you see, there might be little pieces of your life from all of these that you feel God wants you to focus on this year. And I want you to know that none of them are unimportant to God. Then the second question goes with that is, now that I know where I am, where do I want to be? Or we could pose that question slightly different. What is it in my life that I want to change? You see, when I start to establish that, it starts to help me to become focused. Number three, think about this verse of Scripture here. God had promised Abraham that he would become the father of a great nation. He would become, he would have many sons. At this stage, he only had Isaac, and Isaac wasn't even married yet. So while the first promise or first part of this promise was fulfilled, God had given uh, Abraham and Sarah a child named Isaac. Isaac was still not married. So here in Genesis 24, we find out that Abraham is now an even older man, but his son Isaac still doesn't have children. So what did Abraham do? He assessed the situation. He evaluated where he was, and then as a result, he called in his best servant, Eleazar, and said to him, I want you to go out and find a wife for Isaac. I find this scripture so encouraging and very important. There's an important principle here. And the important principle is this. It is never too late for you to make a change in your life, to start afresh, to start to rebuild, or to do something significant. It might take longer than you think. You might think that you're too old, but I want you to know Nothing's going to happen until you decide to start the journey. Every journey in life starts with the first step. So you know what? Stop procrastinating. You can drift through this life for the next few years and find yourself nowhere, or you can get focused and start today. You know what? God always wants his people to have direction. Number two, the second thing we learn Uh, from the story of Abraham and Eliezer is number two, we also need to be specific about our future because you can't be focused on something if you're not specific about it. And so number two, be specific about your future. Look at verses three and four of Genesis 24. It says, and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell, but you will go to my country, to my family, and take a wife for my son, Isaac. So in order to get where you want to be and know when you arrive there, you need to describe exactly what you want. If you remember a few months back when we started talking about our theme for this year, Turn Us Again, we looked at the story of Bartimaeus, And one of the things Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do? Do you remember that? And I want you to know it's so important that we answer this question because it takes our lives away from being vague to being specific. Notice Abraham was not vague. He told Eliezer exactly what kind of wife, where he needed to find her, and what he needed to do to get her. Rick Warren puts it so beautifully. He says, you never reach a vague goal. The more general you are about your life, the less power you have and the more demotivated you become. So you see, when we're specific, it gives us the power to be intentional and it empowers us to say no to the other things that would not assist us or hinder us from getting to where we need to be. You see, when you become specific, you know what your destination point is. And so that becomes like a guiding light. Here are two questions we can ask ourselves with regards to this point. Number one, what is in my hand right now that I can get started with? 
I know so many people, and I've done this in my own life as well, and I've got to guard against it always, is that you always talk about what you don't have. You know, I want to do this, but I don't have that. I'd really love to do this, but I don't have that. And so what we end up doing is we're specific, but we, we're not focused, and what we are focused on is what we don't have. I want you to know, whenever God works in your life, whenever God gives you a promise, whenever He's dealing with us in things, and whenever He wants to lead us to more, He always starts with what's in your hand now. And so you've got to ask yourself, what do I have right now so that I can get started? The second thing is this, what is my motive for pursuing this particular thing? You see, the why always determines the what. When you don't know the why, you know what happens? It becomes too easy to give up, especially when it gets difficult. And I want you to know, when you start to focus your life, when you start to be specific, you will face challenges. You will be tempted to give up. But like Pastor Manny said last week, don't retire your faith. Keep on keeping on. You see, when Eleazar heard what Abraham's request was and what Abraham's goal was, and he knew what he had, he was able to develop the right motive so he could get started moving in that direction. You see, when our motive is right, things start to come together on the inside. And God will show you how, and he will help you solve the problems that stand in the way of your goal. Listen, problems and obstacles are nothing more than an opportunity for you and I to trust God, to grow in our lives, and to develop our faith muscles. Number three, the third thing about this journey is you must remember today, God's promises are for you. You know, the enemy sometimes works over time at not not letting you see the promises, but when you find them, telling you that they are there, but they're not for you. I want to encourage us today. God's promises are for you. Here in Genesis chapter 24, verse 7, it says this, The Lord God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my family, and who spoke to me and swore to me, saying, To your descendants I'm giving you this land. He will send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife for my son from there. <laughs> Notice something. Abraham had grown in his faith. Abraham was clear with Eleazar, his son, he said, uh, his servant. He said, listen, the angel will go with you and he'll make your way successful. Immediately he was standing on the promises of God for his life. Do you know that there are literally thousands and thousands of promises in the word of God and they are for you today? Promises of success, confidence, health, prosperity, strength, wisdom, and more and more and more. There is a promise that covers your situation. You see, God made these promises so that we would learn to trust Him. And in doing so, our faith would grow and it would begin to change everything, not just in our lives, but in the lives of those who we are in relationship with. When you set out to take new territory for your life, you find yourself a promise. You find yourself what God is pulling on you on the inside when you read the Bible, when you listen to a message. And I want you to know there will definitely be problems. I've discovered this. Whenever you find a promise, you will also find a problem. Whenever you find a promise, there will be a challenge or an obstacle in front of you. But don't focus on the problem. Keep focused on the promise. Keep your eyes on Jesus and what God has spoken into and over your life. Look what verse 7 says in the second part again. Abraham quickly addresses Eleazar's fears and worries by reminding him, saying, listen, my God will send his angel before you and you will take a wife for my son from there. Number four, the fourth practical thing I can do to stay on this journey of possessing my land and walking into the much more, number four, I've got to ask God to help me. All of us need God's help 
all of the time. Look at Genesis 24, verse 12. Then he said, Eliezer the servant. Now think about this. Eliezer wasn't even in the covenant with God. He wasn't probably a Jew. He was a servant of Abraham. And look what it says. O Lord God of my master Abraham, please give me success this day and show kindness to my master Abraham. You see, once we have focused our lives, once we become specific, and once we've found a promise that we're going to stand on in God's word, we need to pray and ask God to make us successful. We need to ask him to help us on this journey so that we would have his wisdom. Eliezer got an amazing miracle. God used him in an incredible way to extend the promises of God on Abraham, of which you and I are the result today. You know what that tells me? It shows me that God wants you and I to be successful. So here's what is, what is important about this. Number one, remember, always give God praise and thanksgiving when you have a victory, when you find success in your area. And let me encourage you, whether it's small or whether it's big, give God praise. Stop in that moment and say, Father, I just want to thank you. I just want to honor you. You gave me that success, and I appreciate it. Or share it with someone else as a testimony, not to brag, but to testify and to give thanks to God. Number two, always remember, when you pray and ask God to make you successful or to help you, Always connect your success to his kingdom by being generous. In other words, be part of a local church and get busy helping that church fulfill their vision, whether that's with your finances, if that's using your talent and your treasure, and whether it's using your time, always connect your success to his kingdom by being generous. You know what, church? We should always be looking for ways to help other people connect with God. Number three, no matter how much success you have, decide today that you're going to stay humble and you're going to continue to honor God in everything. This is a challenge all of us need to work through when we become successful. But I've seen so many people in the years of pastoring who came to God with nothing or came to God with something God changed their lives, they got born again, they got filled with the Spirit, they started pursuing His kingdom, and God started to increase and bless them. And guess what? The blessing and the increase became the distraction, and it became the very thing that led them away from God instead of the thing that kept them motivated to serve God. So be generous and connect your blessings to God. Number four, remember when you pray, what you pray reveals what you're serious about. You know, if you've got a, a promise and a goal in your life and you only pray for it once every four years, then that thing's not a promise. That's not driving you. That's not a desire. That's not something you're specific about. You see, when you pray, what you pray reveals what you take seriously. And it's an indication to you and to God that you are serious about that becoming part of your life. Prayer also reveals today that you are indeed trusting God and that you're not relying on your own ability. Number five, the fifth one for today, and we're going to look at another five next week, but number five for today, you need to ask yourself this question, what is keeping me from taking more territory? What is keeping me from taking more territory? Now in Genesis 24 verse five, it says, and the servant Eleazar said to him, Perhaps the woman will not be willing to follow me to this land. If that happens, must I take your son back to the land from which you came? So Eliezer is now processing the reality of what he's been asked to do, and he starts to see the obstacles and the challenges that are in front of him or the things that could possibly keep him from reaching his goal. And I want you to know this is quite an important thing to remember. You've got to ask yourself, why haven't I already reached the goals I'm setting for my life? In other words, what are the barriers, what are the obstacles or the stumbling blocks that are in my way? Today, it could be financial. Maybe you feel like, man, you, if you just had more finances, you could really make progress. Maybe it's a relational problem. 
Maybe the relationships you've allowed in your life are the stumbling blocks that are holding you back. Or is it the knowledge you have about the thing that you want to do? You know, sometimes if you want to become something, you've got to go and study. You've got to go train yourself. You've got to prepare yourself, and you've got to gain knowledge about that so that you can learn the skill. However, for a lot of people, I think sometimes the biggest obstacle or stumbling block in our way is what we would call an emotional barrier. I remember many, uh, uh, probably about a year or two ago, uh, Pastor Manny spoke on the glass ceilings, the things in our lives that prevent us from lifting the lid on our lives and going to the next level. You see, sometimes we sabotage our own success because we think we're not worthy, or we struggle with an inferiority complex, or we feel like, you know, we're just not good enough for that. And I want to encourage you today, when you start doing these first four points, they will start to build a faith and a confidence in your life. Here in Genesis 24, Eliezer identifies a number of barriers to reaching his territory, taking his territory, or reaching his goal in finding a wife for Isaac. You see, if you go read the story and you really think about it and you paint a picture of what the story looked like, most of us would call it mission impossible. Abraham was sending Eliezer to a land he's never been to, to people he never knew, to bring back a wife for Isaac, and he didn't know how he was going to do it. That is a mission impossible. And yet, he stepped out in faith before God with the promise of Abraham that God had given him, that the angel would go before him, and he started to trust God. You see, whatever your barrier is today, You need to identify it before you can remove it. And I think sometimes that's where we really struggle. Here's the truth. You cannot remove a barrier that you don't recognize or understand. And you know what? If you don't do that, it will keep tripping you up. So start to ask God to give you the wisdom to move forward into the much more territory that God has for you. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your living word. Thank you that your word is alive and that your Holy Spirit is working in each of our lives. I pray for my brothers and sisters through the screen, those who are listening wherever they are. And I pray in this moment that you would tug at their hearts, that you would reveal your incredible grace in them and to them. And whatever it is they're trusting you for in their lives, I put my faith with that and I ask that you would lift them up, that you would bring healing to their lives, that you would bring restoration to their lives in whatever area it is that they need today. Now, perhaps you're listening. You've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, but there's a tugging at your heart. This message from the Word ministered to you, and you're saying, what's my next step? All you need to do is simply receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If that's you today, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And if you'll just pray that out aloud with me, Jesus will come and live in your heart. Let's pray. Father, I believe today that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He died for my sins, and that You raised Him from the dead so that I could be saved. I receive Jesus into my heart as my Lord and Savior. Now, just before we say goodbye, once you're born again and you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, there are a few other steps you can take as you become a disciple of Christ. One of them is you can be baptized in water. That is a command of our Lord Jesus Christ. Another very significant one is you can be baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. If you'd like to find out more about that, shoot us an email or send us a WhatsApp and we'd love to engage you. You know, perhaps you have a prayer request and there's something in your life that you need. We would love nothing more than to pray for you. So send us an email, even send us a testimony and share with us what God is doing in your life at this time. We want you to know we love you, we're praying for you, and if you're ever in the Margate and Ramsgate area, pop in and join us for a Sunday service. Now, before I go today, maybe you feel in your heart you want to sow some finances into our local church, into the vision of our ministry. Then you can do so by simply scanning the SnapScan code on your screen. That's the easy way to do it. Or you can go to our website. The SnapScan code is there and our banking details are there so that you can do an EFT. 
Remember, we love you. We're praying for you. And have a blessed week.